Um, I'm now on slide 83. What is the technique used for decoding is spectral density uh, based. So um, I will explain that in a moment. Uh, you're looking at the spectral density of your ECOG signals and try to figure out two conditions, how it is modulated um, between um, um, the hand at rest and imagining closing the hand. A second possible technique is ERDS, uh, event related desynchronization synchronization. That's another, that's not what is used here. Uh, that is something we will discuss in chapter eight. So, um, now on slide 84, um, there you see how the technique works. So, the, the, the researcher had been recording the power spectrum, and you see the power versus plotted versus uh, frequency, the power spectrum in the case of rest and in the case of uh, an imagined closing of the hand. You see that the two curves differ in particular, significantly in particular, uh, frequency bands indicated by the little stars above the, those uh, intervals. And uh, basically, it's the, it's the mu beta band and uh, the gamma band. So you they just uh, look at the power changes and to decide if uh, if the patient um, is uh, is doing anything, wants to initiate something or not. So this is how it works. So it's conceptually very simple uh, how it's implemented. And then you can look at an, it's slide 85. Um, the decoding performance over time, as, as was suggested in the in the in the meeting, and and there uh, you see that um, the performance is hovering around 90% uh, over a time span of 262 days, and the lady is still uh, still uh, around. Um, she's still using it already for several years now. This. Uh, this, uh, this uh, brain computer interface to do her communication. It's slow, two characters per minute. That's not a lot, eh? if you imagine. Um, it's really not a lot, but uh, for that lady, it's a big difference um, um, between be able to do nothing versus something, right? So it's, it's a tremendous difference. Okay, this is uh, concluding that, uh, that chapter. Um, and now I think I need to go through um, Another chapter. So, okay, I will upload the other chapter now, chapter seven. Okay. okay. Hope it works. So it's loading. Chapter seven is loading. Takes a while. Loading, 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 loading. Still loading. Yeah, there it is. Can everybody see it? Then we start now with lecture seven, non-invasive methods for studying brain activity. Okay, so um, electroencephalography, everybody knows about it. So this is slide two, you have electrodes that are placed on the on the scalp and there is sometimes some gel in between it or some, uh, some liquid. Uh, and uh, this is done to make a good galvanic contact between the electrode and the, the skin. So what is electroencephalography is a measure of the brain's voltage fluctuations as they can be detected from scalp electrodes. They are based on so-called biopotentials that uh, are, you know, go through all this, this tissue layers, uh, even through the bone and so on. And this can be picked up by these electrodes. It's an approximation of uh, act electrical activity, uh, for sure, it's voltages of large groups of neurons in the order of, of millions, a huh? very pretty big scale. Um, so in that sense, the resolution is, is very, very limited. I'm on slide four now. So EEG has been around for some time, eh? 19, 1980, uh, and, and 80, sorry, 8075. 
uh, Richard Catton already discovered that uh, the brains of rabbits and monkeys uh, there were electrical uh, electrical things going on there, and but it took uh, quite some years before actually recording on in and. and um, yeah, you have to wait until there, were, until there were amplifiers available that could work in the millivolt range, huh? and then the, and that those came about after um, the this, the First World War in the twenties, and uh, German uh, the German physiatrist Hans Berger uh, was the first to use these kind of amplifiers uh, in in, uh, in humans to de de detect on the scalp. Uh, alpha waves. So he named it alpha. This was the first uh, type of wave he could uh, discover. And he also coined the term electroencephalogram. So the encephalo is, is the brain. So an electrical plot of the brain, something like that. And, uh, but it took until the 50s, of course, uh, in line with the technological evolution, before people were able to uh, discern uh, different uh, EG patterns uh, at different positions on the scalp. And that uh, led to the, to the concept of topography, so that you could figure out differences between parietal and, and, and frontal and stuff like that. On slide five, uh, how does it work? I just said it. So you need to place electrodes and you attach them to the scalp. Um, sometimes they're glued to the scalp if, uh, if it's uh, something like a permanent uh, setting. And uh, yeah, the physical connection is, is needed to, to the, the machine. Of course, uh, nowadays we use optocouplers for that. So certainly when it's medical equipment, there is no electrical contact between between the machine and the, in the yeah your, your scalp uh, your body uh, there is uh, it's done optically by optical signals just to to avoid that uh, not that you get electrocuted but just to be on the safe side huh? okay so if uh, look at if you look at slide six um, there is a lot of evolution going on um, so in the old days you had so-called passive uh, silver silver chloride uh, electrodes yeah, these are centered Electrodes. It is a porous material that allows for biopotential biocurrents to enter uh, the electrode. And in the old days, uh, shown on the bottom left, you had these kind of settings that required scratching uh, with, with, a, with a with a blade, uh, like a razor blade, uh, scratching away uh, that skin cells to make a good fresh contact. This is what what I did <laughs> when I did my master thesis so many years ago. Uh, this was like a painful stuff. Uh, this is no longer uh, needed because, um, uh, as you can figure, the amplifier, the distance between the amplifier and the skin was pretty big. And there was all sorts of artifacts and noise and stuff that could be picked up. Nowadays, we work with active electrodes where there is a pre-amplifier integrated into the electrode, around the electrode, so there's minimal possibility for picking up uh, all sorts of artifacts. And secondly, uh, the impedance that you required uh, to be low, in the case of passive, uh, the passive electrodes can now be, be uh, released and you can have, uh, you know, uh, instead of 10 kilo, kilo ohms, you can go to close to, to a, a mega ohm. So you have much more uh, free from the this, uh, from this issue, uh, you don't need to scratch anything anymore. Uh, you just apply probably some gel or, or some uh, liquid in the cavities of your electrodes, and that's basically it. On the right hand side, you see um, also solutions that uh, work without any uh, any liquid. Uh, they are the so-called dry electrodes, and uh, several evolutions there. You have uh, metallic ones, but also uh, plastic ones using a sort of rubber-like uh, polymer, and the tips of these electrodes are covered with AGCL. You see the white tips there of the electrodes. Uh, it's it's more convenient, of course, but the quality of the signal is is not com not comparable. Uh, it's much less, uh, and uh, these um, yeah these active dry polymer electrodes they wear out very quickly. As you can guess, the coating uh, after after prolonged use is 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 going away quickly, and, uh, and then they become uh, pretty useless. So. Um, this is the evolution, of course, but yeah, of course, uh, it's much more easy to use. 
Uh, slide seven shows a, a couple of alternative uh, forms and instead of that electrode cap, uh, which is not very sexy to to have a more a better solution and that's where we are more friendly, if you like. You see uh, all sorts of headsets and diadems that are under evolution uh, to have uh, to provide more uh, user comfort uh, in putting them on. Um, yeah, 